This is Edward Cowley of Altamont, who served in the U.S. Army from October 1943 through January 18, 1946. This interview is taking place in Altamont, New York, on October 7, 2003, at 10.45 in the morning. The interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. What is your full name and when and where were you born? Uh, uh, my full name is Edward Cowley and uh, I was born in Buffalo, New York in 1925. And what did you do before you entered the military service? Well, I, I had one year of college at uh, what was then Buffalo State and, uh, and in the art uh, education program. And uh, so I went uh, directly from that. I, I was uh, I wasn't 18. I I it's a different form of enlisting. You, you just go and, and tell them you're ready to go in, uh, and then they then you're drafted. So I basically en enlisted. Uh, once you commit yourself and say you know just call me when when you want me, and uh, so. I uh, went in the service and uh, and spent uh, two and a half years uh, at it, and uh, then when I came back, I went back to the same school and finished my program there, and then went to uh, New York City and uh, got a master's degree uh, at uh, Columbia, and then I began teaching and. Taught in high school for a few years, and then got to Albany, and wound up as uh, chairman of the the art department, which you know was a it was an expanding situation. So that uh, we went from a, a department of one person to uh, a program with about 22 faculty members. So that that was an exciting. Uh, thing, guiding that, as it were, and uh, through the whole expansion business. Okay, now back to when you first went into the service, where did you report for your basic training and what was it like? Well, I went to, um, I started by going to Camp Upton, and then I was going to, uh, I was about to be admitted into camouflage. And because of, I did have the art background of one year, which you know was probably unusual to some extent, but I had taken an exam called the A12, and this was an exam that was given nationwide. And the idea for this uh, was to take people and put them in college, and what they wanted essentially was engineers and linguists in the various languages that we would be, you know, required in, in uh, wartime. And so I was about to go into camouflage and they said, uh, uh, if you would pass this test, I took the test uh, actually in the Navy version, which was, it was V-12, it was A-12 and V-12. And they said, if you pass that, the Army test or the Navy test, come over here and talk to us. So I went over and talked to them, and then I went to uh, uh, basic training in the ASTP, which is what called Army Specialized Training Program. And everybody in ASTP was probably 18 or 19, and we were at Fort Benning, and there were lots of us. And we assumed we were going to go to college once we got through infantry training. So we did the full t term of infantry training, which was three and a half months or so, and we're ready to go to, to school. And actually, I was assigned to go to Bowdoin College up in Maine. And nothing happened. We, ju we just uh, you know, stayed there and, and, uh, for a couple weeks. And then all of a sudden it was announced that uh, all the ASTP members were going to the infantry. Uh, the country needed infantry you know, more than uh, 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 
what these other things would have brought out. And so, uh, I guess something like 3,000 of us went to the 94th Infantry Division. And that uh, then when, was in advanced training in infantry. And so we did that. We were assigned to different groups, of course. And I uh, wound up in the anti-tank platoon, the 1st Battalion Headquarters Company. And uh, we trained and uh, then went to New York and uh, went overseas on the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we stayed in England for a short while. Then we went to uh, France and we went to Lorient and Saint Nazaire, which was a kind of interesting thing that the Germans had retreated to these two areas uh, uh, by the, uh, the water in the, in the Mediterranean, and they uh, had the uh, German uh, submarine pens at both these places, at Lorient and Saint Nazaire. So uh, and they had a lot of uh, artillery and a lot of uh, German soldiers, they had, uh, something like uh, 30,000 soldiers. So we had to kind of surround both these places with, uh, well, we basically had, we had 3,000 at each place and then 3,000 in reserve, uh, which uh, I'm talking the fighting part of the infantry, the actual you know, soldiers, there's, there's more to it, but there, you know, there's artillery and there's other areas uh, and uh, uh, components, but uh, the actual soldiers that are gonna be on the front are uh, a, a select group. <laughs> And so uh, we went to Lorient, the group that I was with, and we surrounded them and, and uh, they had 28 battalions of, of uh, 88s, uh, the German, great, the great weapon of the war actually, the German 88 uh, artillery piece. And uh, we had one battalion in our, our, our division and then that was split in two places. So, but. They had lots of artillery, lots of uh, ammunition, and they didn't have any gasoline. So they couldn't really leave. Uh, they could, could have managed by just sheer you know, uh, numbers to overwhelm us easily enough. But uh, then there would have been a serious counterattack and they would have been probably eliminated. So they just stayed there. And uh, it would have been very, very, uh, difficult for us to uh, move in there and take over those two places and there was there was not any really reason to do it so that uh, uh, so we stayed there for a number of months and it was it was kind of light duty I mean not many uh, casualties because there was no one attacking or counterattacking or there's a lot of artillery exchange and there, you know uh, different things happened but nothing on a grand scale then a, a division that was crossing the the English Channel had the misfortune to have uh, one of its battalions on a boat that was sunk by a submarine. So they lost, uh, you know, uh, uh, close to 3,000 men probably, were just drowned. And uh, uh, so they then were with a weakened uh, division and we were, you know, just ready to go and we've been certainly uh, involved in you know small attacks there and uh, we then were designated uh, to join Patton and become uh, uh, part of the, the uh, you know Patton's third army and so we we did that and uh, we we ran into the situation of the Battle of the Bulge and that was our first big uh, activity and so we, we went up and uh, attacked the southern uh, flanks of the German uh, army and, uh, and we kept doing that for the rest of the winter. And so we got there, you know, a little after Christmas time and, and stayed in combat, you know, when, until the war ended, I guess in May sometime. But that's, is that, does that give you an idea of what, what, what happened? That's, yes, it does. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've seen movie versions or have heard reviews like from Tom Brokaw on The Greatest Generation, the horrible conditions that you had to live under during those battle days at the Bulge, 
that it was extremely cold, that there was no support in the air because of the weather, and uh, the physical uh, being unable to take care of yourself, uh, showers and so forth. Describe some of that. Well, it, the, the, the part of the air support uh, was only temporary because the, the, the bad weather gave the Germans a chance to really break through. But once, uh, once the weather picked up, uh, uh, the American superiority in, in air power was able to move in. But in the meantime, when you're on the ground, uh, you know, this is, uh, is something else. And, uh, you know, we got uh, involved in some very serious uh, battles. And uh, uh, finally, we, we were the first uh, division to reach the Rhine River. But as I mentioned in this one talk that uh, just recently, uh, we didn't have a chance to change uh, our clothes at all, and, and uh, uh, we literally lived outside. I mean, the uh, the, the line soldiers were, were there. That was that was it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it turned out that uh, it was three months. Uh, I was three months in the same uh, underwear, and finally. Uh, they were they were rotating people back, and, and this one, uh, you know. But even here, you know, they they weren't uh, 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 anxious to do this. But there was enough of a calm situation for a while, so they could do the they rotate people back. So I went back, uh, you know, thirty miles or so, and uh, where they had hot showers and and. Uh, uh, and and that that was quite an event actually because I, my my feet were so used to being cold that I couldn't step in the hot showers. It, it was like your feet were burning, but I stayed with it long enough and, and finally uh, uh, got a shower in and uh, and was was given another pair of underwear to start all over again. But uh, that the situation was was bad, but it, uh, you got used to it in a way. Uh, and uh, uh, there was it was uh, a lot of snow that year, and uh, you just you acclimated yourself to the situation. The Germans had, of course, the same problem, and uh, it uh, it was uh, like over in the Pacific they they had too much heat, and we had too much coal, and uh, but that's uh, that's the, the the way that went. What was your food like? What did you eat? Well, uh, K rations or C rations. Uh, we had a kitchen. Uh, each company, uh, the company is about uh, 200 soldiers, uh, has a, a cook and uh, some other cooks with the, the main cook, and and they prepare food when they can. In, in uh, normal conditions, if you're in uh, bivouac or you're, you know, in, in camp, everything works just fine. But uh, they would be somewhat, they would follow the, the movement of, you know, where, where, what was going on. And they would bring the food up in, in jeeps. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, uh, you know, find food you know, that way. Or we'd just eat whatever we, we, we you know, had in, the, in these uh, ration systems. But, uh, you know, we were never really hungry. I mean, we, uh, the, they, they did this very well. I mean, they provided well. And of course, they gave us cigarettes. So uh, everyone learned to smoke. If you hadn't smoked before, this was a good time to do it because it seemed like a military, proper military thing. And uh, uh, the problem, one of the big problems was with the feet, and the, uh, trying to keep, keep your feet warm. And uh, when you're in a foxhole or you know, just outside all the time, and if they get wet, and the, you had uh, often either uh, trench foot or, or frozen foot uh, feet, and uh, and that we had a lot of casualties uh, for that. I that's a kind of unfortunate casualty, but this is uh, something where. Uh, there's a saga of the 94th Infantry, and uh, it's uh, 
we were dubbed Roosevelt's Butchers by Axis, uh, uh, by you know, Burrow and Sally. And I'm, I'm never quite sure why, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, that's, that was a, a little cute name that we got. But we had 10,000 casualties. So if you figure there's 9,000, uh, we, and the casualties are not all uh, killed, uh, you know, the majority were wounded. Uh, and, but the people with the, uh, the, the foot problem would also be considered casualties. But that's, uh, this is uh, the, the way it looked in uh, the Winter War. And now did you, uh, you mentioned foxholes, you had to stay in those, or did you have... Yeah, well, you wanted to stay in <laughs> Yeah, I would imagine. The, uh, did you have to dig your own and all that too? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you wanted one, you had to make your own. Mm -hmm. but, uh, now, while you were out there, were, were there any occasions when you saw the top brass come out and give pep talks? And um, yeah, Patton came one time and and uh, and said that we were going to be on the Rhine River in six days, and we didn't move for three days, and we were beginning to think it was some kind of a, a just a. Uh, kind of a joke he was playing on us. But then once we started moving, we, we moved and we didn't stop. And we, we just went right through the German lines. And actually we got, we got about five miles uh, from uh, uh, Ludwigshaven and uh, the tanks caught up with us. And the, in, in those days, uh, people will remember that they always, there was Patton's tanks. Patton had tanks, but he also had infantry. And the infantry was often leading the tanks. I mean, the tanks would love it if the infantry <laughs> was out there first, because a, a tank is a very, uh, it's a, a powerful thing, but it's also, uh, it can be very dangerous if, if uh, as it turned out to be very dangerous in this instance, because we could have gone right into, uh, in, into Ludwigshaven, but the tanks wanted to go through us, so, uh, so they went through. And we just went off, and, and uh, actually, we, by that time, we were smart enough to go into buildings. Uh, so we just, you know, would find a building, and, and people would jump in, and, and you, you had a, a blanket, and, and that's where you stay. But the, the next morning, we discovered that the tanks had been knocked out, and, uh, and we had to take uh, Ludwigshaven. Matter of fact, I had a bottle of champagne that I had liberated from somebody cellar. And I drank the champagne, and I was going to, someone woke me up and said, we got to go to Ludwigshaven. I said, the tanks are in Ludwigshaven. <laughs> I said, the tanks didn't make it to Ludwigshaven. Oh, Christ. So we walked by uh, the, uh, the tanks, and uh, there were uh, dozens and dozens of tanks that were, uh, that were knocked out. The Germans had, had their artillery on, on rooftops, and basically they trapped the tanks. And we wouldn't have been that easily trapped, you know, because you know soldiers can run in all different directions, and and uh, but anyhow, they they just knocked the tanks out, and and they also they had their own. Uh, there's, there's infantry that travel with tanks, and they they got knocked out too, in these uh, troop carriers. So we walked by that, and it was a real terrible scene, and and uh, and got into uh, Ludwigshaven without any. Uh, any particular problem, uh, the Germans got out as soon as they'd done this, and just uh, and they crossed the river wherever they could, and uh, you know that's uh, that was that. Did you have uh, many Germans surrendering, or did they stick not together? At that, not at that time, uh, but later on, yeah, you know, we, we did. Uh, they were, you know, well previous and you know, a couple a month or so before that, a, a whole group had surrendered. But the Germans were were really committed soldiers, and uh, they would surrender if if the situation was impossible. But I think we were pretty much the same thing. Uh, so that, uh, uh, but they and and prisoners were being taken as we we, we went right by people who were surrendering, uh, and and we didn't stop, and we would just uh, it was more important to take the ground. 
than to um, you know to stop and and, and then, then you got prisoners. You got what are we going to do with them? And uh, so the more rear echelon elements uh, just uh, rounded them up and uh, and so on. But they. It's so different from t today. We, we knew who the enemy it was. And uh, I don't know that I would like to be in the kind of wars we're having uh, currently. Uh, there was nobody around. When, when we were um, in an attack situation, there were no civilians at all. The civilians had, had moved to whatever direction they could possibly move to be out of the way of what was going on. And, uh, and we had really practically zero, uh, uh, you know, terrorist type things. Uh, uh, now and then the, the somebody would do something and, uh, but uh, ordinarily, you know, all through France we were liberators, so we didn't have any problem with that. How did and, the people react to you when you took over control of an area? Well, they weren't there. Mm -hmm. We got into Ludwigshaven, but the, 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 they, the uh, that was a little different. Was, that's a, that was the, where they made uh, a poison gas, <laughs> which which we were alarmed about, because they thought, wow, if we, you know, with our artillery and everything else, uh, we could uh, be in trouble from the poison gas. And meantime, most of the, uh, the guys had had uh, lost or discarded their uh, uh, gas mask. But fortunately, there was you know, nothing happened with the gas. They didn't want to start using it uh, there because we had our own gas. That, you know, so, and uh, uh, but the I picked up a phone in uh, this one building, and the, uh, a German voice answered. The boss is an Omba, and, and I said the number's up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, uh, they were they were still hot there in that particular instance. That there were people in in the city, but. They were all buttoned down someplace, and uh, so we didn't really, you know, see uh, much of them at all. In contrast to all these other situations that we've had, uh, you know. Uh, but it, you know, asking uh, some of the questions, I uh, we we were in when we were at Lorient. Uh, we had a situation where this is this town uh, uh, a few miles outside of Lorient, I'd say. And we went in with our 57 millimeter anti-tank gun. And that is this kind of a weapon. It's a, a, a small rifle, really, a 57 millimeter. And, and uh, it, there was no one in the town except our, our squad, which is, was uh, 10 men. And our anti-tank gun. <coughs> well, um, they uh, you know, right away started shooting uh, accurate artillery right on our position, and it was uh, uh, there were people there were sort of French soldiers there, and in, mixed in with the French were a few traitors who who were would locate for the Germans. They might even have been Germans mixed in with the French. But anyhow, they, they, they knew where we were, it seemed. And uh, so this is where I got a, a minor wound in the knee. And, uh, but anyhow, that, uh, our, our truck, which pulled the gun, was, was on fire, and uh, buildings all around us were burning. And it turn, turned out that ammunition was stored somehow or other in one of these buildings, and that was exploding. And this was actually our first a serious day in combat in, in uh, this uh, Lorient area. And it was heavy duty for Lorient, which is basically sort of a peaceful place. Well, anyhow, we, uh, we left and we, we got the, uh, the fire out in the truck. And uh, so I was just trying to I say it must have been Burke, who was our uh, sergeant, who at some point declared the position untenable. So we hooked the gun to the truck which was now just uh, smoking while uh, without flames. Stone jumped uh, in the truck and took off back down the road. The rest of us carrying carbines and M1s started to withdraw. We ran past burning uh, buildings, 
all ex uh, uh, with all explosive explosions until finally we uh, connected with stone and the truck. We we stopped, <clears throat> we hopped rather aboard and continued our our departure for Hennebon. And we came to uh, an intersection and turned right. All of a sudden, we were on a bridge and headed across the river. Someone realized it was the wrong road. We were going to Lorient and not away from Lorient. And uh, uh, let's see, let's see. We, we stopped and jumped off the truck, discontinued, disconnected the, the gun and spun it around and ran uh, the gun back and you know, running it by hand uh, back off the bridge. Uh, why the Germans didn't shoot at this spectacle, we never knew. The stone rapidly uh, backed up and we quickly reconnected the gun and took off in the right direction. But that was a kind of a, a scary moment. But then this, we got back to our, uh, our company uh, our location, and I thought that was it. We weren't going to go back. But the captain said, uh, why aren't you guys there? And I was, well, well, we decided. You know, and so he was a little angry with us for leaving this. And it, actually, it was a very wise move to get, get out of there. So he sent us back, and uh, the next day we went back. At this time, we didn't go as much forward as we were, so our gun wasn't quite that visible. But I'll be damned, the uh, Germans once again knew exactly where we were. So they were, they were firing at us, and <laughs> we had been digging foxholes, and, uh, and the foxholes weren't complete. Uh, so you're lying in the foxhole, uh, you can go under, but you know, they were watching the bursts and so on. But it, uh, and they fired every, every three minutes, they would fire two rounds or three rounds. And so it got so we could get up and dig a little bit, you know, uh, because there, there, was, there was such a regular kind of barrage. But anyhow, then I said, we, this is, a, I mean, it's mentioned a funny part. This, you know, is, is kind of a funny thing. And I mean, at the time, it wasn't all that funny, but the, uh, we were still very new to all this. The foxholes were okay, but we, we uh, would have been better off had we gone into the sturdy houses close by. Finally, uh, the firing ceased for the day, and we went. We began to do other things. Ralph Marx, uh, an older man from Los Angeles, who was a jeweler actually, and he was 38, and you know I was uh, I was 18, so I, he was really like a father figure. But he was my loader for the bazooka, and as you might expect, we we called him Harpo. The two of us went down the road. Uh, forward of the gun, looking for locations for launching these small rockets. Now, this brings us to the crux of the story. Suddenly, dozens of the French troops came running towards us, uh, excited and scared. They shouted, La Boche attaque, La Boche attaque. Uh, <clears throat> this wasn't supposed to be happening, so I, I stepped out and motioned to one of the fleeing Marquis. Uh, he stopped and I asked, Combien Bosch? He replied, Trois mille. Uh, he paused and, and, and sort of smiled and said, Americans ici? And I said, Oui. Then he quickly asked, Combien Americans? I, Combien Americans? Uh, uh, I said, uh, I had to say, dies. But then he said, dies mil? 10,000? And, and I said, no, dies. And then, uh, if he'd been running fast before, <laughs> he doubled his speed, and it was like a cartoon where his feet were running and he was in the air. And anyhow, he shot away. But it, uh, uh, we went back and uh, we were all given permission to withdraw again, so that our, our gun was attack, attracting so much artillery wire that it just wasn't worthwhile being there. And uh, 
that I had suggested when we were back the first time that we just go back with bazookas because they wouldn't be ex excited by bazookas. But the captain says, "No, this is your main, your main weapon, and you take it with you wherever you wherever you go." Well, I imagine you put a lot of miles on your feet during those years. Yeah, at times, but, mm -hmm. but mostly. Uh, uh, you know, we, we were. You know, with an anti-tank thing, you were uh, uh, oftentimes you know, riding if you're moving the truck around. Uh, but the, the, there's a little distinction between being uh, anti-tank or being a, a, a line soldier, uh, you know, a, a rifleman. And <clears throat> the rifleman, of course, even, uh, you know, the rifleman got to ride if it was, it was uh, possible. <clears throat> but... In this booklet, I tell the story of, of Orschultz, which was a German town which we were uh, uh, supposed to uh, attack. At, I mean, we were supposed to attack. We, we, we did attack. Uh, at, uh, and uh, it, was, it was a very bad scene. It was a winter, of course, and, and uh, snow and all that. And, and when we weren't being used for our anti-tank thing, we were available to be used for whatever else was uh, needed. So we uh, we carried ammunition for the rifle companies, and uh, for a while, actually, we were ahead of the rifle companies, and and probably someone realized that we got the anti-tank group that we had to go back once we got to the line of departure, which is where the, where the attack was going to start. And we would go back and then be ready for a counterattack and move our guns into position and so on. But anyhow, that never happened. Uh, that, well, we, we did get to go back, but uh, uh, this describes this in detail. Um, we got there and it was, we, we, were, we were late. And the, the time, the attack was supposed to uh, uh, begin at dawn, and it was getting brighter and brighter, and nothing had happened. But what did happen was that we were in a minefield, and the Germans had this elaborate minefield, and uh, we left, the, 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 our platoon uh, left and, and we went back, and as we were going back, uh, machine gun, German machine guns opened up, and and closed off just after we got across this little pass, and and so everyone that was in there was was surrounded, and uh, it was a it was a very very uh, difficult time. Uh, well, anyhow, then we they they selected uh, some of us to go back in again with uh, grenade launchers, which are the things you put on a rifle and then one. And so we, we started on the road to do that, and uh, a, a, cheap, uh, a jeep pulled up uh, alongside us and said, where are you guys going? And we said, well, we were orders to go into Orschultz and, uh, with these uh, launchers. And he said, no, you're not going there. And I said, uh, why are we doing that? And he said, uh, because everyone goes in there, will be another casualty. So he said, just turn around and go back wherever you're came from. So that probably was helpful in, in saving uh, lives <laughs> of our group as, as specifically. Uh, but then the, the battle went back and forth and you know, people were, were uh, and, and we were now on the, the perimeter of it and there was nothing we could do. Uh, one company uh, com uh, you know, it was really had a lot of casualties, and they, uh, B Company, surrendered, and uh, the other companies were able to withdraw. And uh, but the 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 loss was, you know, of the 800 men in the battalion, we lost about 400, either killed, captured, or wounded. And a lot of the wounded froze to death because they uh, there was uh, not much they could do. Uh, there are medics there, but uh, uh, the medics uh, were in trouble too, and so anyhow, that was the the most serious kind of thing. Uh, and anyhow, that this whole story is about that. And 
Then one of the oddest thing was uh, when we got back, we withdrew, you know, uh, a mile or so, uh, and another battalion moved in, and a uh, a Protestant chaplain appeared, and he uh, he said if anyone wanted to uh, attend a, 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 a religious, uh, a, well, it, was a, it wasn't a service as much, it was just a, a religious moment. And uh, so about a hundred uh, of us were there and on a hillside in the woods, and uh, and this the chaplain was marvelous. He just he didn't say anything, uh, uh, and I was worried for he for fear of what he might say. Uh, but he he recognized that the bad thing had happened, and uh, and that uh, we just had to to uh, maybe say a prayer, and uh, and he said, "Let's just be quiet." And uh, that was a very touching moment, really, the whole thing. And then finally, uh, uh, you know, a few words were said, but nothing, you know, offensive in, in any way. And, and uh, but then, about two weeks later, the Catholic chaplain showed up, and uh, and oh, maybe there were a couple dozen of us went to a mass that he he was having in a kind of bombed out church, actually. And the first thing he said was, I understand some of you men attended a Protestant service. And I was so mad, I could have killed him. I had my rifle and I thought of it. <laughs> this isn't <laughs> going to look good. That, uh, you know, it was not a Protestant service that the, this Protestant chaplain had. It was a service for for us, mm -hmm. and uh, anyhow, that that was the most the most angry I think I've ever been. I never quite recovered from that, and uh, but uh, anyhow, that, uh, that was that. So what happened if he said it? I understood you'd been to another service. That had, what did he do for his? Well, but service? the idea was uh, he was going to have a regular Catholic mass, mm -hmm. and. Um, I, I think I stayed for it, mm -hmm. but uh, but I didn't want to. But I, I just uh, I stopped listening to him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, but it was a disappointment because I was a Catholic and I, I felt embarrassed, uh, you know, by the mm -hmm. by the accusation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, but anyhow. Mm. Now I take it, the, how was your equipment compared with what the Germans had that you had to work with? And well, it, it, was, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, their guns were good. Their, you know, uh, um, their tanks had a, were, were better than ours, and, mm -hmm. and the 88 was better than anything we had. But we had you know, you know, reasonably good uh, equipment. Uh, they were able to supply you. Uh, were there well, times when you came close to not having any? No, you know? no. We, we, but I mean, this would happen. Uh, you know, uh, you know, in some situations, like in in uh, the Ardennes, uh, you know, paratroopers were cut off, but they, they were able to, you know, to get supplies to them. It was a great thing having air superiority, uh, because this uh, this opened up all you know sorts of things and. Uh, uh, and we never, never had a, you know, our particular outfit never had any problems with, with that at all. Now, uh, how, uh, did you receive uh, mail fairly easily while you were there or not? Now and then it would come, you know, it was a... Care <laughs> packages? You could, yeah, uh, yeah, they would, you know, packages would arrive. It wasn't a high priority, I think, but but uh, it was really a, a kind of um, amazing that they were able to, to be as uh, effective as, as they were with this. Uh, I'm still were, surprised they were almost as good as you know, <laughs> regular mail. And, were there ever periods uh, when you had the luxury of seeing a traveling USO show? Uh, no. 
think so. Uh, after the war, when we were in Czechoslovakia, uh, we had uh, had some uh, you know, shows. Uh, but uh, but nothing, you know. There it was. It was hard for them to, you know, when you're you're engaged in this sort of thing. That there's there's no way that uh, you know uh, anyone can do anything. Uh, <coughs> it would be very unfair to anyone to try to do it. <laughs> and uh, and also, you didn't want to get in gather in groups any place. Uh, because the uh, more spread out you could be, uh, the more difficult you were to um, to find, and uh, you know, and to uh, track down. And so that, uh, you no know, one thing when you said another a, a, a funny thing happened uh, when we were. Uh, let's see. Like. I think it was when, when uh, uh, I should read my own thing more. Uh, we were on the, the move and Patton showed up. But when, when we were pulled off, with the, when the uh, tanks were going to go through us that I told you about initially, uh, someone suggested we're just going off, you know, and like this. But you stayed together as a company, so you knew where, you know, where you were. But there was, you know, you you could sleep wherever you wanted. You can find space in anything. But someone said they had seen a barracks back a mile, a German barracks, and they were filled with uh, with mattresses. And uh, why don't we get some mattresses? And so we had. <laughs> we had, we think I think we took three trucks, and I was in the second truck. We went back and we grabbed uh, you know, all kinds of mattresses and threw them in the truck. But coming back then, Patton caught up with us, and and he he stopped, you know, and he he said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and it was it was comical because the first sergeant was in the first truck, and he's so busy saluting, and said, so, uh, "General, well." Don't tell me what you're doing. What in the name? And he swears like crazy. Are those mattre are those mattresses I see there? Yes, yep. And it, anyhow, he, he just blew his stack. He says, get those goddamn mattresses off the truck and get back to the war. And so we threw our mattresses off and went back to, uh, you know, and that, uh, but it was funny. Here, Patton, in the midst of all this, uh, locates people who are, you know, there's nothing wrong with getting the mattresses, but his idea, you know, uh, comfort, you know, he must, we must have rubbed him the most wrong kind of way you can possibly uh, have, have hit him, you know. So he screamed and hollered and then he took off like a bat. And, uh, but anyhow, that, that was a funny story even while it was happening. And uh, we shouldn't have done it, and he let us know we shouldn't have done it. But we did take the orders, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, looting shop in the next day, and we left the mattresses right in the road where we threw them. So did you ever get to use them? No, no. Oh. We just sort of threw them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we probably had, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 mattresses on each of these trucks, and we just threw them off. Mm -hmm. And into the snow and, and uh, you know, the muck and everything. So, uh, so then, um, where were you when they declared the war in Europe over? What were you doing? We were in a town called Velbert. And uh, we moved up to uh, Velbert. And uh, we were at the Rhine River now. And they crossed uh, farther north and they crossed south. And we weren't involved in that at all, and uh, and so we all we had to do was just be there, and and uh, we, you know it was a uh, I'd say I was cutting my toenails when the, they said the war's over. Uh, but that's was nice. everyone cheering, and, or uh, couldn't you quite believe it? Or uh, we had a feeling it was going to end. I mean it was. 
the Russians were coming so fast, uh, you know, into the uh, in Germany, and we were we were going like like uh, like crazy, and uh, you know, it, uh, there was no place for them to go. But there was a place to go. There was a, there was a, in, in Czechoslovakia. There there is a, a they called it the the national redoubt, and what they did, Hitler did, uh, he ordered the most fanatic of the Germans to go there and fight, you know, fight on. And uh, and I mentioned this in one of these articles, and uh, so they moved us there. To to you know to make sure they didn't fight on, and they didn't. I mean, the, the Germans are the, and they they had been fighting now for years, and they had you know, when I, we spent uh, you know like nine months in combat. Some of these German soldiers had spent five years in combat, and not many of them because you didn't uh, recycle. Uh, you know, it, it, it didn't last that long. But as an interesting thing here. I, show you that our division uh, created, uh, it's a long story, but a war memorial in Germany for both sides. And uh, now this was, uh, I got this stuff to This is a German who was the, the head of this uh, uh, Panzer Infantry Division. And we fought them for a long time in, in, in the Tsar Moselle Triangle, as they call it. But uh, here he is, and I don't know, this won't be visible at all. Uh, Colonel Tiem, and this is our Colonel Warren. And, uh, you know, meeting, and here's the, the thing, uh, dedicated to both sides. And then uh, one of the craziest things, when when they had this meeting, when they, uh, and uh, our guys were invited to, you know, to dinner uh, with the, uh, well, actually, this is a, a, a little different situation. It was at the last reunion of this uh, uh, German uh, 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 d division. And some of our guys were invited to it. And the guy, one of our fellows from Del Mar, is, is uh, uh, Warren, Bill Warren. He was there. And, you know, what they they presented the Germans with, and Tim was there too, it was his group. Uh, it might not have been at the same time as the memorial dedication. But uh, they presented them with a great big picture of Patton. <laughs> <laughs> And this is how, you know, it's amazing that uh, the way things can can spin around. The Germans stood up and applauded, and uh, you know, it was you know, uh, uh, it was ama it's an amazing kind of response. But it was very bold to to push Patton out of it. What the hell? So they all stood up and applauded. Uh, and where did you say this monument is again? Well, it's in Germany, and I, it's, uh, it's near where we were, in, in some place in the Tsar Moselle. I've never been there. I've never gone back. I was going to ask uh, you if you'd ever revisited Europe since you left. You no, know, I, I wanted to, uh, but I didn't want to go back to, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to see any of the military stuff. Uh, there was a friend of mine, an artist friend, Rudy Helmo. And Rudy uh, was German, and he went to uh, Bavaria, and so I, I wanted to go back and and spend some time, you know, with uh, Rudy and his family. And Rudy came here when he was like 18 or something like that, and then he went back when he was uh, 50 maybe, and in, in uh, this town in Bavaria. Almost everybody there was related to him. The, it was a town of about 400 people, and the mayor uh, was was his cousin, things like that. So he went back, and uh, and he would do paintings there. And I we have a couple of Ruby's paintings around the house someplace. But 
they considered him the American. <laughs> <laughs> and he finally decided that he was, uh, he was, uh, uh, he must have been an American. He became an American. So he came back and then one time, because he had made this trip many times, but he realized that he was more American than German. And uh, so he, he stayed here. And then he got Alzheimer's and uh, that was, that was, that was too bad. But now you uh, mentioned that there was a person that you've become a lifelong friend with as a result of your activities. Yeah, uh, and I'll show you his picture as well. Uh, he's in here, uh, Tom Manthe, and a number of people who are actually lifelong friends in a way that the, so do you get together for reunions and things they, like that? Well, they this? have reunions all the time, but this, this is Tom Manthe, and this mm -hmm. was at the Bavarian Chalet over on, you know, uh, Route 20. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a couple of years ago, and this, this is Jimmy Carey, and, and uh, he's on your right, I think, and on the that's me in the middle, and on the left is uh, uh, Carrie's son, who is a colonel in the service. Hmm. But uh, and here we are with our 94th Division hats on. And <coughs> we went to Tennessee two years ago to the reunion. There was just a reunion last week, uh, uh, well, September 20, uh, two weeks ago. I almost last week, but uh, this was the upstate chapter of the 94th, and so, but it, it was held in this, uh, you know, uh, in Rome, New York, uh, at uh, this beaches. very, very nice uh, restaurant. And beaches. We stayed over the beaches. We stayed over. Have you been there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll tell you a little story. Yeah, right. But. Uh, no, we don't see them. Uh, we're, we're in touch with one another. Uh, and Jimmy lives out in California now, but... Uh, I notice uh, you have a 94 on different things. Uh, 94. Yeah. 94. Tell us the significance of that. That's just the number that was assigned uh, to the 94th. And, you know, some... The big red one, the famous... Uh, is it just a big red one? And uh, we're nine and four. Uh, when the war was over, we came back with the 80th, most of us did. And the 80th had three hills as their, uh, their badge, their, you know, their uh, insignia. And so I, when, as soon as we got there, I asked somebody, what, the, what do the hills stand for? And he says, two to one, you won't come back. <laughs> so. Hey, anyway, I'm glad we had the nine and four. It sounds now. When you came seven. back, uh, you said earlier you had finished college. You went on to teach. And mm -hmm. how has the military influenced your life? What are things that have happened? Uh, have you joined any more organizations other than reunion groups? And uh, yeah, I, I I joined the the. Uh, 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 American Legion as well as the VFW. And you have uh, a little story about the VFW. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us the little story. <laughs> well, during during uh, the Vietnam uh, War, there was a uh, there were, at one point there began to be questions asked about what what was uh, what, why was this going on what were we doing and so on and. I wasn't the activist. Uh, my wife, Betty, was in on the, some of the marches in Washington and so on. I stayed home and watched the kids. But uh, the university wanted to establish a post <coughs> which was dedicated to peace. And so that made me realize that uh, I don't think these, all these posts are war posts. I don't think that all veterans are in favor of war by any means. Uh, so, um, I decided to join the, the uh, VFW, and to, much to my surprise, I was uh, rejected. And they had a, a thing which is uh, certainly not democratic, 
or uh, I don't think it's very American, that you can blackball somebody and uh, an unidentified blackball keeps you out. One blackball and you, 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 you can't get admitted. And the person doing this, I discovered later on, I don't, I mean, he's passed away, but uh, uh, he was telling people and uh, that I was a communist, which is ridiculous. And, uh, uh, but I, finally, I, I, dis, I joined a post in, in, uh, in, in Albany and that, that took care of the thing. <coughs> and later on, uh, after this fellow got out of the picture, they asked me to, to switch membership. <coughs> so I switched to, uh, to Altamont. And, uh, and so it's, uh, but it's been kind of funny, like uh, two, two years ago when the, they had this ceremony for, um, for people who were uh, recognized with a medal. And there were only two of us uh, Getting them, we got a medal for this New York State uh, medal, uh, conspicuous, conspicuous service, service uh, you know, for the medals that we had, and and after being refused admission <laughs> so many times, it was kind of ironic to be getting a medal there. And say, but all that's been forgotten. I mean, uh, you know, that these people that are not there any longer that were were the problem. And uh, now we have about four minutes left. Uh, you mentioned the home front cafe you helped design. Well, yeah, but I mean, just the color on the outside and stuff like that. But, uh, and some of your artwork has had been influenced by your. Um, you had a couple pieces of artwork with your uniform. Yeah. Uh, I, and this is a thing I when we were talking about castles before. This is a castle that. It's a blue castle. It doesn't show up blue here, but uh, I did this and uh, and decided to dedicate it to a couple of, of fellows I was in the service with, in you know in combat with. And uh, uh, blue is the infantry color, and that uh, I realized I was working with the infantry color, so I, I I did that. And the flag that flies over this castle has a nine four on it. So, mm -hmm. but this is a little thing you're explaining, you know, uh, I can read this, I think it'll just take a minute. The, uh, no, no, I won't bother because it's, uh, uh, okay. uh, but well. I, I use the 9-4 in lots of ways. And here was the 100th anniversary for the Altamont Fair. I did this, uh, uh, these were all different numbers done in different styles a hundred different uh, numbers, a hundred different ways. And right up at the top there, it ends with a nine and four. <laughs> so it was, uh, that was sort of fun to do. And uh, have, most people don't know what it means at all. Yeah. Uh, so it, uh, I, I enjoy doing it. Okay, well, we thank you very much for spending this time with us and telling of your military experiences. Well, thank you. Okay. Hold it now. Okay. That's before yeah. and now. Yeah, there we go. How about that? Uh, this guy here. Yeah. And Jimmy just had a heart operation about 